Before giving his people the Ten Commandments, the Lord reminded them about his own love and grace. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Jeremy Barrier is Associate Professor of New Testament at Heritage Christian University and a missionary to South America and Southeast Asia. In this lesson, he helps us consider the prologue to the Ten Commandments. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing in front of uh, six gentlemen who were actually on an elevated platform and they were looking down at me, the lights were on me. I could see three rows of law lawyers sitting just to my left representing uh, Walmart and then there was probably a hundred people all behind me and I had about 90 seconds to say what I needed to say. I could feel the sweat beginning to fall down my, uh, from my forehead down past my temple and onto my cheek, and I was trying to get it all out as best I could and voice my opinion and my concern to these members of the city council, and I don't know if I was getting my point across. You know, it was all very tense and had to be said just right. You know, what we're looking at is Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and here at the very beginning, we have what we refer to as a prologue, but if you really think about it, what we have is a royal pronouncement, a royal pronouncement here at the beginning of this text uh, in Exodus, and it's God who's going to be making this pronouncement, and the most astounding part about this pronouncement is the ones that we famously know of as the ones that are composed on stones. So what I want us to do is to look at these, uh, just these two verses. Wait, hold on just a second. Oh, it's my wife. I've got to answer this. Give me just a second here. Yes, comma, I will be happy to meet you at Rick and Tony's for lunch at 1130. Love you too, period. Don't you just hate that? <laughs> I did that on purpose, of course. Uh, you know, but I'm so amazed by these technologies, and this has very much to do with what we're going to be talking about over, over this short amount of time that we have together. But, you know, when computers uh, first came out, what was amazing to me is that computers originally come out, they're, they're so big, there's one in like one room, and it's shared by NASA, or eventually it trickles down and it's shared by a whole university. But sure enough, the technology continues to develop, right? And the technology finally develops to a point that it's going to be put in a form like this. And to be real honest, I'm not a big tech guy necessarily. I'm not really into, into phones. In fact, I held out on getting a cell phone until basically my employer said it would be good if you had a cell phone. And so that's when I got it. And, and really, that's kind of the litmus test for me that the technology has finally permeated the culture that I live in in North America. And interestingly enough, in a lot of my travels overseas in Asia and South America and in Europe, I've seen in places in very remote parts of uh, Vietnam or Myanmar or Sri Lanka, you'll see kids pulling out cell phones. It's, it's a, it, the, the, the technology has actually gone throughout the entire culture. Now, what in the world does this have to do with what we're talking about? The last comment that I actually made before I conveniently was interrupted by my wife uh, asking about lunch had to do with the technology. You know, we never sit down and think about if God wants to speak to Israel, how is God going to speak to Israel? And we always refer to the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets. And, you know, we never think about the fact that when God decided to write it on stone, and typically in the ancient Near East, they're going to be writing different forms of cuneiform, uh, and it's going to be written on some type of tablet like this, like that made out of clay, that's easier to write on. This is not ancient at all. You can buy this at Hobby Lobby, and you can find 
cuneiform online and you can sketch your own little stories out as well but this is typically how it's going to be done so you really have to stop and think that if something's going to be written in stone and that type of technology did emerge what we're seeing is that Israel is having the uh, Ten Commandments put onto stone and the most basic form of these commandments is very simple and needs to be brief if you're going to be carving into stone and not clay so when you look at the Ten Commandments, one of the fe features that we see about it is the brevity of these Ten Commandments. In fact, Commandments uh, 6, 7, and 8, if you look at, at them in, in Hebrew, and here's the Hebrew text right here um, that they were writing in, they're actually just two words. Two words, three syllables, and it's very um, terse, succinct, well-stated, these are the Ten Commandments. This is the cutting-edge technology of 2,000-plus years ago that we're seeing being employed. And not only is it a cutting-edge technology, but we're seeing it being a technology that's employed for the community. You know, you can imagine there would have come a certain point in which these Ten Commandments that are cut in stone could be copied down, and as they were, onto an even more advanced form of technology, the scroll. Scribes could write them with some type of ink or dye and write them on a scroll and then they can be uh, just sent throughout all of Israel uh, to, to offer the teaching and instruction that Israel needed to have these pronouncements from God. So when we actually look at verses 1 and 2, what we're seeing in a very formal sense, a very early technology of God pronouncing that he's about to make this more or less a royal decree or announcement that Israel needs to hear. So let's look at it. Let's take just a few moments here. And God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord your God who caused you to go out from the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Very simple. But several things that stick out to me in this passage that seem to be very important that I would like to draw attention to right now is just like I stood before that city council and made that pronouncement, had to choose my words wisely, here we see God about to make a very formal pronouncement in front of Israel. And he's using... Moses as a conduit to make this, these statements and this message. And so God is about to make this all-important statement for, for all of time now, as, as we well know. But at this point for Israel, and it begins by saying God spoke. I think it's very fascinating and interesting that God is a God who chooses to speak. And not necessarily, it doesn't say God wrote at this point, God spoke. And it's the same way that God did uh, uh, speaks in Genesis chapter 1 and speaks creation into existence. Uh, we're talking about a God who makes a very conscientious decision to not only speak, but then uses Moses as a conduit to write these things down. If you turn over to chapter 34, verse 28, I believe, 27 and 28, you can see where Moses is then uh, getting these things put down into a, into a, to a finished form or they're, they're working on this uh, together. But God speaks. God is addressing Moses. That's important. A second feature that I see in verse 1 that, that really stuck out to me that I thought was very fascinating is, is, is interestingly enough and amazingly enough, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 does not say, Ten Commandments. Literally, if you look at the text in Hebrew, it says these words, all of these words, or you could translate it as uh, these ideas or these concepts uh, or, you know, there, there's a number of different ways you can translate that. But what, why is that important? Well, you can obviously see, you know, as you go through, you can count up to ten, but part of what I see in this is that we have these teachings that are being offered by God that are going to give us some idea about what God is like, what God expects, what he's expecting in particular 
of Israel. And we do eventually get the, the, the word 10 that comes in, and that, but that once again, that's in, in Exodus chapter uh, uh, 34 that I mentioned just a few moments ago where you see all of that lining up. But at this point, we just need to see that these are the words that God wants to be stated and very clearly put before Israel. Another feature that seems important that we get in this text comes in, in verse 2. In particular, in chapter 1, it says that God spoke. God being uh, Elohim, a very generic word for uh, God. But specifically in verse 2, God says, I am the Lord, and this is uh, Yahweh, uh, or oftentimes translated Jehovah. So in particular, it's like giving his personal name. I am Yahweh, or oftentimes it's written as the Lord. I am Yahweh, your God, in particular. That's who I am. But after that, after he tells them his name, he then goes on to say, who who did these certain things for you? I'm the God who did these things for you. What did you do? Well, I'm the one who caused you to come out of the land of Egypt. And if you backtrack throughout uh, the, the earlier parts of Exodus, we begin to see that Exodus chapter 20 is not sitting here all alone outside of the context of the entire book, but there's a story behind this. You know, this is the culminating event. In fact, Exodus chapter 20 falls right in the middle of the book, 40 chapters, this is the centerpiece. This is the beginning of the fulcrum, the balancing point of the entire book in which we see God now defining himself in a new way to Israel as a people. And he's doing it formally. You see, if you go back to earlier in the book of Exodus, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, Exodus chapter 3, for instance, we see God standing or not standing, but appearing at the burning bush with Moses. And one of the questions that Moses, Moses has uh, to put before God is, you know, God, you've just told me to, to go into Egypt and help liberate this people from the mightiest nation of the world, Egypt, uh, you know, to, before Pharaoh. How am I to do this? And God says, well, you tell them that I am sent you. Tell them that, the God of, uh, in particular, that Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the God who's come to deliver Israel out of Egypt. Now, the reason I find it fascinating that he mentions that earlier in the text is when, by the time we get to chapter 20, there's been a few more things that have happened. We've We've just passed through some major events where Moses does go back and he picks up Aaron along the way and they go into Egypt and they, there's the story about that related to the, the ten plagues and then finally Pharaoh allows them to leave and then changes his mind and as they're crossing the Red Sea, here comes Pharaoh and finally the grand deliverance of the children of Israel and Moses and the Egyptians are swallowed up in the Red Sea as they pursued them. And now we are seeing God saying, hey, I am the God, Jehovah God, the Lord. I'm the one who delivered you, caused you to come out of that oppression. Wow, God's actually redefining himself for Israel. You have to imagine for just a few minutes that you are an Israelite. You're one of these people who have been living in Egypt. You've heard stories that are circulating about your own past, your own culture, your own people, where you come from, about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, experiences that they've had with Jehovah God. But however, you personally may not have many specific stories to pull from. You haven't had all of those encounters with Jehovah God. And now you've just been through these extremely dramatic events, these life-altering events, there you are out in the middle of the wilderness and God speaks and says, I'm the one who caused you to be able to come out of that. It's no longer just the story of one particular family. It's grown into something bigger. And we're seeing just the start of that here in this text. And I find it profound and interesting. You know, there are other features in this text that are important for us to notice as well. In particular, I want us to really draw attention to the fact 
that when God does choose to define himself, he says that I am the God who basically brought you out of a land that was oppressing you, a land that was offering you slavery. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot for people when they have a job where if they're if it's too restrictive on them personally, they begin to feel that just that it feels begins to feel like a straitjacket. People deeply, deeply desire and need to have some levels of freedom in their life in a lot of different areas, or they it's just intolerable. And God's saying, Hey, I'm the God who brought you out of that. I'm the God who's offering you this newfound freedom. And and the story continues to be interesting because they wrestle with that freedom. It's almost too much. It's almost too great for them to be able to, to, to handle all of that. But yet, this is the God who's going to give them that opportunity to really shine, to really experience uh, a full life. And that's what God wants to be. You know, when I think about this passage, there are several things that come to mind that I've, that I've shared with you as we've looked at the, the different verses and we've tried to look at the different words in the verses but there, there are just a few applications that I, I think are important that you can take home with you. Number one, God is speaking to them. And in, in, in the same way, God is desiring to, to speak to you. Maybe it's directly through the study of Scripture in this class right now, but God is desiring to connect with you as a human being. God's always desired that. And that's one of the things that jumps out to me in this text, and we need to pay attention to that. Secondly, a second point that I find very valuable. When I read the Ten Commandments, what I soon discover is there's a whole lot more of the Ten Commandments here that I'm learning just at the very beginning in the first verse that tells me that this is just as much about um, me understanding who God is and what God is like. It's just as much about that as it is about what God expects of me. You see, we have a tendency, and this is a very normal human tendency for us as humans to be very centered upon ourselves, and um, and we're always asking, well, what does God want of me? What does God want of me? Does he, he just want me to be baptized or immersed in water? Yes, I'll do that. Uh, does he, what, what are his requirements? Well, God actually is desiring more than that. God's saying, no, 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 no. I don't just want the requirements. I want you to understand me. I want to have relationship with you. And, and, and this is the beginning of it here. It's not just 10 dictates that come down where God just throws it at them and says, go do it. No, no, this is a God who's trying to offer them something, uh, something personal from God himself to Israel. The third thing that I find very fascinating here is that God wants them to understand very clearly in this public pronouncement that God is a God of freedom. You see, while we may be under a new covenant, the message is still the same in terms of who God is and what God desires. The expectations on how to access that freedom have obviously been altered and freedom is brought through Christ. But yet what is God offering Israel? Liberation from slavery, liberation from Egypt. So what I find interesting is that God is the same, whether we go back thousands of years or or we are talking about the God who's seeking to interact with us even in the world today and uh, and seeking relationship with his church today as well. That's the God that that we serve, and that's the God that is talked about uh, and addressed and is talking here in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Just to close... Just a little over a week ago, I returned from uh, a mission trip. Uh, I spent some time in India, and I was there with uh, an alumnus of the school here. Vinay David graduated uh, a little over a decade ago and is, has an awesome ministry in North India. And then also spent some time in Sri Lanka. And both cultures are very similar in a lot of ways. And one thing that really sticks out to me in particular, we, we, took, we took a 26-hour train ride uh, from New Delhi, India, into the middle of nowhere. Uh, 
we were five and a half hours from any airport that could get us back to Delhi by the time we finally arrived at our destination. And we were in this town that uh, the only way I know how to describe it would be it was a form of a coal miner's town where there were uh, five or six different uh, coal and nuclear plants powering uh, this massive industry that they have put into this very rural setting. And the air was so thick every night around 5.30, all of the families, because there was all of that coal there, they would set a, a, a little tub outside of, uh, or a container outside their door, fill it up with coal and light it. And of course, if, if you've ever seen coal burn, it puts off just a tremendous amount of smoke, thick, thick smoke. So I, I just remember I was, I was out jogging and I was running across uh, a, a river and I was on a bridge and I could just see the coal smoke coming in and rolling in like a fog over that riverbed. And then by 7 p.m., you could, you could barely see 30 feet in front of you. The smoke was so thick. Obviously, I, I had a little bit of respiratory trouble as all of us did. But the thing that stuck out to me the most in that entire experience of seeing all the coal and, and all of the fires was I could not imagine living there. Day in, day out, this is what they experience. They breathe this constantly. But not only that, I would start to look at the houses that they're living in. These, why are they setting, setting these little containers outside their house for, for coal fires? That's because their house it's as small, of this, as small as this area that I'm standing in right now, about, oh, eight feet by eight feet, or sometimes six feet by six feet in diameter, only about six feet high, just little bitty huts built on the side of the road. By the thousands, whole families are living like this. Kids running uh, everywhere, and they, they basically are using the house to sleep in and for, for shade against the sun as it gets up into temperatures of 100 to 120 degrees in April and May. And I thought, that's difficult. That's really hard. You know, just the, the, the people feel different kinds of oppression in a lot of different ways. And when I read a passage like Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, I'm very quickly reminded on how relevant and how important it is to see our God, Jehovah God, the Lord, first things first when he wants to make a statement to humanity as he did with Israel. I want them to understand that I desire a relationship with them. I'm speaking to them. I want them to understand that I'm a God of deliverance and I have a name. And my, what, what am I going to do? I am here to offer freedom. I'm here to offer liberation. God is here to offer that to us as well. What a powerful and profound statement that we see in this text. I hope you enjoy the rest of your study of Exodus and thank you for your time. As the deep As the deep for the water, Lord, for the water Lord, Lord, so my soul, so my soul.